friendship, but a legend with his ability to break up Jack Benny. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I spent a, a long time with him. Uh, I interviewed him for Playboy magazine back in 1977, yeah. and I, the stories he told about Benny and about George Jessel and that whole group. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. President, this, uh, this interview will be published July 3rd. So what thoughts do you have uh, this year as America prepares to celebrate Independence Day? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, I think that that holiday, the celebration of our nation's birthday, is, uh, has continued to be uh, a really great holiday in the spirit of our, of our country. But I think right now there's every reason for our people to feel patriotic and proud uh, of their country out of this economic uh, problem that, that we've had. The way the country has rallied and supported private initiatives, efforts to resolve some of the problems without turning to government. In a time when we're economically strapped, you would expect uh, some things such as charities and uh, worthwhile efforts of that kind to, to suffer, and they haven't. We've been breaking records with people's willingness to contribute, to help. And the, our own effort here to stimulate private enterprise projects to resolve some of these problems has just uh, taken off like a skyrocket. We've, we have uh, in the computer here more than 3,000 programs at community levels or service levels or organizations that are formed within communities and areas to take care of everything from uh, the needy to the getting jobs for the unemployed to just almost every community project you could think of. We have them computerized so that other people who want to answer some problem, respond to some problem, can call, we can put them in touch with individuals that already have a program doing whatever it is that concerns them. But all of it, and uh, our armed forces, the same thing that has happened to them from just two and a half years ago when morale was at zero, when uh, people were saying that the volunteer military was a failure, that only through compulsion could we uh, then provide what we needed. In this short time, uh, it is a tremendous success. We have a higher level of individual in the armed services, both with regard to intelligence and as to education than we've ever had in the history, even when we had drafts. Um, a morale that is sky high. The other day, uh, tying in with those private initiatives things, I, uh, the fact that we've asked government employees in our budget request to do without things such as increases or uh, meeting any cost of living pay raises and so forth. I received a letter from Italy, a hundred Marines or so over there, that signed that letter just voluntarily to tell me that if that would be of help to the nation, they'd be happy to do without any pay raises and so forth. Mr. President, let me ask you a question about uh, the uh, Central American policies. Some of the reaction uh, to your policies has been very emotional. Uh, the name Vietnam has been invoked often how do the situations in the two areas differ so that you can offer assurances that U.S. troops will not fight in Central America? I think to begin with, it's a different situation. Um, we have, in El Salvador, for example, a country that has proven its confidence in its own people by submitting to an election even while there were armed guerrillas attacking that, that government. And the people with an 80 percent turnout or better, of the vote, upheld the government and proved that the guerrillas did not reflect the desires of the people at all. They have never asked for the kind of military help that was delivered in Vietnam. Uh, true, they need uh, materiel, but still our economic help, 77 cents out of every dollar that area has been for economic help, only 23 cents has gone for military training or equipment. But in Vietnam, you had a situation in which a longtime colony of France called French Indochina 
in the decolonizing that took place after World War II. Uh, the great nations met in Geneva, including our own, to uh, help in this process and what would take place in formerly French Indochina. Now, when that separation was made, two countries were created, uh, South Vietnam and North Vietnam. They had been separated before the French made the whole area a colony in early history. So two nations were created again. Now the one, uh, growing out of a force that had come together to resist the Japanese occupation of French Indochina, Ho Chi Minh's group in North Vietnam, they just automatically were the government of North Vietnam. South Vietnam was, you might say, a new country now that had to be taught and provided with all the things that go with being a government. And we were there to advise on how you could prepare and build a military uh, for self-defense or their own defense. It was a, a case of starting from scratch. You didn't have any officer corps or anything else. And that's how we were in there, with advisors, in civilian clothes, not even, even in uniform. Supposedly, there was a revolutionary factor or faction uh, within South Vietnam. But now that the North Vietnamese have conquered, uh, we find out that no, they were North Vietnamese military who were infiltrated in to pretend to be South Vietnamese rebels. And they themselves have exposed themselves. The, I think there were mistakes made. Uh, if we were going to send the military in uh, on the idea that no military defense had yet been organized in South Vietnam, then it should have been uh, sent in in enough force to have ensured to that there wouldn't be combat. But uh, to draw that parallel to what we're doing in Central America, uh, the only parallel that you can bring between the two Vietnams, or between Vietnam and Central America, I should say, the only parallel is that after we had withdrawn, and after we had brought the South Vietnamese up to where we believed they did have a military that defend themselves. We participated in the kind of negotiations which are being uh, urged today by some in the Congress. Negotiations not on the basis of <clears throat> participating in a democratic election in El Salvador, but negotiations that the guerrillas, still armed as an armed force, should be negotiated with as to their right to share in the government without taking it to the people for a vote. And we did negotiate in the Paris Accords. The South Vietnam would stay where it was. North, Viet or Nor or North Vietnam, would South Vietnam's army would take over its own defense. And the United States would guarantee to provide the ammunition and the arms if North Vietnam broke the treaty which North Vietnam did, and then the Congress of the United States refused to keep the pledge that had been made by this country and provide the funds for helping to arm South Vietnam. Isn't that what some are kind of urging on us today without us ever having been involved in El Salvador? To take the wherewithal away from the El Salvadoran government. President, uh, Richard Nixon, among others, has suggested that you should meet soon with Soviet leader Yuri Andropov. Do you think a meeting with Andropov would be useful, and do you have plans for such a summit? We're prepared for that. We've stayed in touch with the Soviet and in communication with the Soviet Union. Um, the one thing, and I don't think that former uh, President Nixon uh, uh, spoke contrary to this, uh, I believe I know his views on that. You don't have a summit just for the sake of getting acquainted and to say, well, we, we met. 
too many hopes are raised when you have a summit meeting. Too many people are waiting for some tangible result. And then, well, we saw this example once under President Johnson, then to just come home empty-handed and say, well, yeah, we shook hands and had a nice visit. Uh, people's hopes nosedive. When there is an agenda, when there is something to really be resolved, yes, we should have a summit meeting, and I'm prepared to do so. Uh, Mr. Nixon also once commented that you, quote, may be too nice to be president. How do you respond to that? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, uh, I appreciate being called too nice. I don't know whether that's true or not. But uh, no, I don't see any reason why uh, you have to have a streak of villainy in order to hold this job. Uh, Jimmy Carter told us in an interview recently that uh, he regrets not developing a closer relationship with the press. How would you describe your relationship with the press and how well is the press doing in covering your administration? Well, I think personally, on a personal basis, I, I think we get along well. On the other hand, I think that there's a broad section of the press that does have a, a political bias or a political viewpoint uh, that is contrary to mine. And uh, therefore, I find myself bothered at times that uh, I don't believe that they've uh, looked at both sides of some issues. What uh, has been your single greatest accomplishment since taking office? I would have to say the economic turnaround. Uh, what we proposed when we came here, the, our administration, was a complete reversal of what has been going on for little, almost 50 years as to the theory of government. And during all those years, the debate uh, between, let's say, the side that I represent and uh, the Democratic majority, which has been in control, even though it did not hold the White House all the time, there has been a Democratic majority in both houses of the Congress for all but a very few years. And the only debate in economic measures had to do with uh, how much would be spent. Could, uh, uh, could we reduce some of the increases in government intervention in the private sector, government spending for additional social reforms and, and social tinkering? And uh, We've turned that around, and the debate now is uh, over how much will the cuts be <coughs> in spending. What, uh, on the other side of the coin, what has been your greatest disappointment in this? We didn't get as much of what we asked for as we should. If we had gotten all that we asked for in reductions in the increase in government spending, and this is something that has not been properly told to the people and that the people don't understand, we have never asked for a reduction in what was being spent. We have asked for a reduction in the projected increases. We, when we came here, government was increasing in cost at a rate of better than 17% a year. And we have that almost immediately and have continued to bring it down since. But even so, and as I say, we never did ask for it to go backward and have a budget less than the budget before. And yet most people, we've talked budget cuts so much that in their minds we have taken away from government programs. We've reduced government spending. And my regret is that if we had been given the reductions we asked for in increase of spending, the deficit, projected deficit for this year would be more than $40 billion less than it's going to be. What was the uh, biggest misconception you had about the presidency before you occupied it? Well, the truth is that there, there weren't any real surprises. And I lay that to the eight years as governor of California. You know, we've turned to other than governors for a long time 
presidential material. And the truth is, the only political job in the country that is closest in experience to the presidency is to be governor of a state, mm -hmm. uh, not a member of the legislature. And uh, therefore, uh, I, I have to say that the routine was pretty much what it always had been, granted that it's on a bigger scale, and granted also that uh, as a state you don't have a foreign policy. Uh, but it, uh, there haven't been, I think I was kind of braced to, mm -hmm. for what was going to happen. Have you seen any information recently that would indicate that the nuclear freeze movement is being orchestrated or manipulated by the communists? Well, we do know this, that voice was first given to the idea of a nuclear freeze in Moscow, Brezhnev proposed this. We also do know that uh, they have instructed their representatives throughout the world, their agents, to propagandize uh, their masters of disinformation and to keep this stirred up and going. Now, when I once criticized the movement because of this factor, there were many people that uh, thought this was red baiting and that I was intimating that everybody involved was uh, somehow a communist tool. I didn't mean that at all. And I believe that the bulk of the people are truly sincere and well-meaning. But I don't think in many instances that they're aware of the fact that the Soviet Union is continuing to propagandize this worldwide, is providing disinformation uh, that some people innocently pick up and use. Now, I know that what I'm saying is probably going to cause a furor again, but um, this is evident to the leaders in the Western democracies in, in Europe. They know that this is done. And it takes me back to the riotous days on the campus in the time of the Vietnam War when I was governor. We knew this from police intelligence, we knew it from uh, any number of reliable sources, that where once upon a time the Soviet Union during what was called the Cold War uh, dealt in communist front organizations uh, in our country and went in to promote things behind the front of some kind of organization. Their tactic had changed at the time of the student riots. And what their mission was then was to be on both sides. That wherever there was a division or a controversy or a split, see if you couldn't widen it and keep it going. And uh, so maybe something of that same thing is going on here with regard to, to this movement. Mr. President, you've said that uh, you're not in favor of a single four-year term for the presidency. Would you favor a single six-year term of office? I must say I've toyed with that idea. I can't tell you that I've uh, got a firm belief in that. Uh, I really can't. I know that four years for a single term in this office, I learned that as governor also. Many of the great accomplishments uh, that we had in California, the welfare reform, things of that kind, though only the foundation had been laid in the first term. Uh, it takes a while to so get in to uh, find out where all the buttons are. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I, I can't really answer you as to whether six would be enough in a single term. If it would be one thing about it, you'd be automatically a, a, a lame duck from the, from the first day in office. Mm -hmm. Uh, Luke Cannon and Tip O'Neill, to name two, have concluded that uh, you will not run for re-election. How reliable are their predictions? I think they're guessing. <laughs> and uh, maybe, the, maybe the way they're guessing is, uh, uh, is father, or their own wish is father to the, to the thought. I haven't made a de decision because I've simply refrained from it from the standpoint that Number one, I think it is too soon. Um, 
there are hazards in either way that you would decide. You then would be a lame duck if you decided too early, uh, or uh, you would then be accused of everything you wanted to, uh, to do, uh, that it was because of political campaigning. And besides, campaigns are too long. Uh, we don't give the people any rest in between mm -hmm. in this country anymore. But uh, I've also refrained from even thinking about it, figuring that that is a decision to come down the road, that to start thinking about it now, whether you don't want to or not, could flavor your decisions on things that have to be decided. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be the most honest person in the world. If you're playing cards and you inadvertently see another player's card, you can't take out of your mind that you know where that card is. So I don't even want to hear, and the people in the cabinet know that, in cabinet meetings, I don't even want to hear the political ramifications. Mm -hmm. Will your wife, uh, the doctor, will her feelings uh, be the deciding factor in your decision to run? Well, no, but we always have done things together. I, I don't uh, imagine either one of us has made any important decision in our lives without it being mutual. Are you, are you both comfortable with the situation, with the presidency? Yes. What would you hope to achieve if you served the second term? Oh, the complete turnaround to a government that was spending within its means, to a government that was less uh, of an interventionist in uh, the private sector, and to a government that had succeeded in restoring more authority and autonomy to local and state governments. I think we have gone a long way, and I, and I think also that we've reversed, uh, or at least slowed down that process. We've gone a long way toward forgetting that the greatness of this country was based on being a federation of sovereign states. Uh, there was a concerted effort, and it belonged to the philosophy of the majority party. Uh, started years ago at the time of the Great Depression that um, we needed to centralize authority in Washington and that the states should just be administrative districts of the federal government. Well, the thing that makes us unique in all the world is that sovereignty of the states. That uh, if you're tried for murder in this country, you are tried for having violated a state's laws. It is the state that tries you and punishes you. But many other things were left to the states by the founding fathers and their wisdom and they properly belong there. Uh, Mr. President, how has the uh, assassination attempt changed your outlook philosophically and your priorities? Well, I don't know that there's been any, any great change. Uh, uh, maybe I'm a little more aware of uh, uh, security now. I thought I was before because I had that kind of security for eight years in those riotous days as governor. But uh, no, if there is one change, I, from a standpoint of not even knowing I'd been shot to begin with, to then later uh, discovering how close I had come, uh, and being aware of a succession of, of miracles, uh, happenings that lessened the danger uh, to cite one uh, on the day that I was I walked into that emergency room at the hospital as I say not knowing I'd been shot and uh, as it developed the bullet was about one inch from my heart that the entire medical staff of the hospital every doctor was there they were in a meeting there was no having to wait a half an hour for calling for some doctor or 20 minutes or whatever it would take for them to get there. They were all there. And uh, things of that kind, I guess I, I have a feeling that whatever time I have left belongs to the power that was responsible for that, those miracles. Where, uh, where do you take your troubles? Uh, how do you refresh your soul away from this, uh, this pressure cooker? <laughs> well, I've always loved uh, 
one line in the scriptures that I look to the hills from whence cometh my strength. Now, if I can't get to the ranch in California, at least between times I can get to Camp David. But there's something about that and uh, getting on a horse and out there in the, in the countryside that uh, does things. Does it? Yeah. Uh, President Kennedy used to relax by reading Ian Fleming's James Bond novels. Do you have any similar reading relaxation? I like to read. I've always been a voracious reader from the time I was a kid and uh, love to read. One of my frustrations is now that uh, there are books that uh, I'd love to read novels on, but uh, there are also books that I, I feel I should read, not only biographical but technical books and so forth. But in all of that, mainly my reading is nighttime when, when I get in bed and read myself to sleep. Um, First, I have a whole packet of homework I have to go through, and uh, I'm getting pretty sleepy by the time I've finished with that <laughs> homework. And it, I have books, uh, two or three up there, with the leaf dog-eared, where I've, uh, as far as I've gotten in them, and some of them have been there many weeks before I can get back and pick them up again. For our sports fans, um, in 1930, Babe Ruth signed a contract for $80,000 and some sports writer cracked. Now you're making more money than the president. And the Babe replied, I had a better year than he did. <laughs> uh, these days, nearly every pro athlete makes more money than the president. Is this fair? Yes, I, I think so. The, I think the president gets enough and the very fact that he is then pensioned and so forth, uh, no problem there. I do feel this. We, we really have a Puritan streak in this nation. And there are many positions in government, not the presidency, in which the type of personnel you get, for example, in our cabinet, people that are willing to serve their country and leave incomes that are as much as 10 to 15 times greater than they're allowed to receive as a cabinet member. And this extends below the cabinet, other appointed positions of the same kind that an individual has to make a tremendous sacrifice to hold those jobs. Now, maybe that could be reviewed for government, but more than that, suppose the salary stays the same and they continue to make the financial sacrifice. Over the years, there's been a body of legislation built up that really uh, is demeaning, as if somehow those people got those jobs to benefit themselves in some way. Um, for example, you can no longer get a Christmas present, even from a friend you've been exchanging gifts with for years, without you having to make it public and tell how much it cost. Now, someone close friend sends you a sweater for Christmas, how do you call him and say, how much did this cost? Uh, there are things of that kind. The, the, uh, the questions that have to be answered by an appointee before he is confirmed in a government position are questions that uh, uh, would, are almost in the, in the asking of the question, a challenge to his integrity and a, and a and a denial that he has been willing to make the sacrifice he's been willing to make. And many of them are unnecessary with regard to proving someone's integrity. They are an unwarranted invasion of privacy. And you'd be surprised sometimes that an individual just has too much pride and was willing to accept a position and said when he sees all of that, he says, I'm sorry. So, Mr. President, how would you like your political epitaph to read? Oh. Well, I hadn't thought about that. Um, what about uh, what he said he'd do? He did. And one final question. As a high school senior in 1928, you wrote, Life is just one grand sweet song. So start the music. 
Now, 55 years later, do you still endorse that optimistic sentiment? I found the tune is, is pretty good. It plays? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, thank you. I like that impact. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you want to turn that off? Okay. All the years I've been in the business, I don't know that they're too complicated for me. They always scare me. I'm always afraid that uh, they won't record. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they don't, or you lost anything, like. Yeah, we've uh, got you covered. Okay. We've got it. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.